Hey everyone, Dan here with uh, another video. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about World War One and the history of Veterans Day. It's Veterans Day 20 weekend 2018, and um, so I thought it appropriate to talk about World War One and Veterans Day because the two are tied very closely together. Veterans Day, sometimes called Armistice Day, they they, they established um, to um, me to for the memory of those uh, who fought in the Great War, the War to End All Wars, um, as it was known at the time. It wasn't called World War One at the time because World War Two hadn't happened yet, and they were so convinced by the horror of World War One as we know it now that there wouldn't be any more wars. Um, it was particularly gruesome, uh, bloody war. Um, What's unique about it, or interesting, I guess, is that the war started out with a lot of European militaries uh, still organized and fighting in the 19th century in a lot of ways. I mean, if you look at the French, uh, their uniforms were still blue and red at the very early part of the war, like they had been in the Napoleonic era. There was still a lot of horse cavalry using lances, like, I mean, medieval style almost. They had, um, There was swords are even still being issued and even including the u.s military um and the war quickly with the modern industrial era moved into more modern uh technology machine guns uh, faster firing bolt action rifles um and it caused a lot of casualties early on because um they didn't adapt right away to the to these new tactics and once they did, they, the war kind of bogged down into the trenches. We know, today. you know, they were they were locked in these trenches, fighting across no man's land. There was gas, there was all kinds of artillery, and um, it just made for a really horrid war. I mean, all wars are, but you know, this one was really shocking to the people of the time. They had never seen anything really quite like it, and. Um, so that's why it was called the War to End All Wars. It started 28 June 1914. Um, a Serbian um, assassin killed Archduke Ferdinand of, of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. And this triggered a series of events that would lead to the war uh, as a greater whole. Um, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Russia... You know, being Serbia, being a Slavic nation, declare, you know, decided to back Serbia and declare war on Austria-Hungary. Um, Germany is kind of made out often to be the villain of World War One, but really, they the only the reason Germany became involved in World War One was because they had a defense uh, pact with Austria-Hungary. So, because Austria-Hungary declared war, Germany was. I guess you could say obligated by their agreements to support Austria-Hungary, and um, you know this and the al you know the uh, Allied nations, France, Britain, Ireland, eventually the U.S. Uh, you know then they said, well, okay, well we got to declare war on on Germany, Austria-Hungary. So this one person being killed caused this domino effect that would lead to you know this four years of war, which came to end on November 11th, um, 1918. Um, so that's kind of a short little synopsis of some of the events. I mean, it, it's a very complex period in history. There's, It really changed the world map, um, especially the European map. It ended the German Empire. Uh, the, you know, Germany being a Christian kingdom came to an end as a result of World War I. Um, during that time, also Russia being a, a, a kingdom or an, um, came to an end. The Tsar was forced out during the Communist Revolution. So there was a lot of change that took place during these four years. And it would, World War I would have this long shadow that would uh, carry on through the rest of the 20th century. As we know, it led to events of World War II, which then further, you know, um, changed the world map. And it just was this. It was like the snowball that just kept going through the whole 20th century that started with this one man being killed. So in the museum here, I don't have a lot 
of World War One artifacts. They're expensive. Um, they're they're out there, but I just you know I've never I haven't had a lot of money to invest uh, in World War One artifacts. But I am fortunate to have a few here, and um, you know we'll start off checking out this this bayonet. This is um, this actually I I obtained in the museum through a grouping uh, that belonged to a World War Two veteran who brought this back uh, with a group of uh, other German artifacts and then his uniforms. But it actually is a World War I, actually predates World War I, French sword bayonet. And um, you can see it's quite large. And this was kind of typical of the size of bayonets of the time. Not necessarily designed, they all varied a little different, but they were all in this small sword format. And that's that was... They were still issuing swords to officers and cavalry at the time, and um, because of that cavalry warfare, this these long bayonets could either be wielded as a sword. You see, it has the uh, hand guard here, or on the end of a rifle would work like a uh, a pike. You know, like I said, going kind of go back to medieval times to defend against those cavalry charges. And um, I'll put some video or some photos in with the video. You can see uh, the the type of lances that were still used even by the uh, the Germans. They're quite interesting. But this bayonet, um, you can see, I think is dated 1876. Uh, I'm sorry, the focus isn't. There you go, 1876. But uh, really in excellent shape and just a great a great piece of World War I history. So, um, you know, give me a moment here. I got to adjust our camera so we can keep rolling here. All right, sorry for that uh, break. <clears throat> Pardon me, break in the video there. Had to make some uh, camera space. Um, so, so we were talking about that French uh, sword bayonet, and um, up above there we have another uh, blade. This is a U.S. bolo knife, and these were like a trench utility knife. This one's dated 1917, and this design came actually from the U.S. involvement in the Philippines. Uh, they, the Filipinos, had a knife very similar to this. And they were kind of meant for chopping through the jungle in a machete type way. Um, now this would have had a uh, wood grips and then a um, a webbing, a cotton webbing type sheath, like similar to that pouch there. Uh, I picked this up at a flea market years ago for not a whole lot of money. It's obviously not a pristine example, but it is a neat World War One artifact. And um, you know, the U.S. was only involved in a war for. I I think six to seven months, the la very end of the end of the war. Um, and I got to double check my facts on that. I'll do that. Um, but you know, our involvement in the U.S. was pretty pretty limited in comparison to the um, European nations, and that would be you know the U.S. didn't really want to get involved uh, early on in the war. So up above here, I have another uh, U.S. artifact. This is a uh, ammunition pouch for the uh, uh, 1911 automatic pistol. Um, holds two seven round magazines. You can see it's dated 1918. Next to it, we have a US aluminum canteen. This one dated 1918. The, uh, these were used all the way up through World War II into the you know early 1960s before the plastic canteens. Um, replace them but it's an m1910 canteen so this design actually predates world war one uh another item here this came in that same grouping as the french bayonet it's like a keychain or some other form of kind of war art um that was made out of german coins and if you look they're these coins you see deutsch deutsches reich which you know the german the German Reich, and they're dated various 1912, 1898, 1909. So these are all pre-World War I or World War I era um, British, British, excuse me, German silver coins. I have no idea why I said British there. We're talking about Germany, but um, so that's, you know, another neat artifact there from that time period. Uh, what we have here is a well, kind of like the classic image of a U.S. or British soldier during the World War One era, and that's a, a, a M1917 helmet or kind of a doughboy helmet. This one's in really 
rough shape. I'd like to restore it eventually. But uh, helmets in general were kind of a new thing for soldiers uh, in World War I in the fact that prior to World War I, um, they really had fallen out of use by the kind of early part of the 18th century. Um, arm, armor, you know, was used kind of throughout the 17th century, 1600s. But uh, as the 1600s came to a close, it was becoming a lot heavier and more expensive to be effective with the advent of firearms. So, um, they, you know, you would still see some troops, especially the French, wearing helmets and armor even in the Napoleonic era. But by the end of the uh, 1800s, you just didn't really see soldiers wearing helmets. Well, uh, that started to change with World War I with the trench warfare. Uh, there was a lot of artillery being used uh, with explosive shells and um, you know they needed to do something to keep guys or soldiers protected while they were sitting down in the trench and that's why this helmet you look at sometimes they call these just the tin hat it looks like a hat and, you know something coming in this way it's not going to provide a whole lot of protection but if you look at the top imagine you're sitting in the trench and shell fire fragments are coming down like this that was what their thought process was now these particular helmets didn't they weren't that great they're not they're not very thick they're in comparison to some of the other like the german helmets i think these were stamped out of a single sheet of sheet metal and if i remember the germans used two or three sheets so but they were better than nothing you know they would provide some protection and um, this is just kind of an evolution one of the evolutions of how warfare in world war one went from the uh, 19th century into the 20th century was the advent of, of helmets being brought back to the battlefield. In addition to helmets, they did start experimenting with armor, body armor again. Um, very similar. They started looking back to those designs from the, you know, the latter part of the armor era in the 17th century uh, for inspiration. And they did issue in limited numbers body armor that did provide a, a fair amount of protection. Something else that was kind of it's kind of notorious with World War One is is gas. Gas attacks uh, were uh, first time really ever used was World War One. Uh, things like phosgene and chlorine, mustard gas, that caused uh, terrible, you know, burns and you know would lead to, you know. Um, you would you would die from basically suffocation if you if you inhale these gases. They would you know damage the lung tissue and not allow you to breathe. And um, in this here, you can see some of the different uh, gas masks. Uh, you know, here's the German one, classic, you know, the German Stahlhelm. That was their steel helmet and kind of iconic of the German soldier. Uh, and here's some of the different types of masks. Some of the early ones, they were very simple. They were just cloth. They didn't actually have a specific respirator or anything. It was just a cloth with some eyelets to, to cover your face. Uh, and then they started using different types of filters and um, let's see here's some gas casualties of the first world war so the British Empire non-fatal injuries 180,000 deaths 8100 for a total of 186,000 casualties the French had a total of 190,000 casualties the US even though we're in for a short period 72,000 casualties caused by gas uh, let's see, Russia, 475,000, so they had the highest number. So you can see what kind of damage the, this gas caused, whether it was death or just severe injury, skin burns, scarring. And, um, you know, those numbers, it was a total of, let's see, 1.2 million uh, casualties caused by gas. And to put that in perspective, there was a total of 35 million casualties in the war, uh, total now that's civilian and military uh, and that's wounded and killed so but you know this really devastated Europe and uh, back here we do have I do have an actual example of one of these gas masks so we'll take a look at it it's very fragile we're not gonna t I'm not gonna take it out completely uh, I mean you can imagine this thing is quite old uh, but we will take a look inside of it and you can see inside that there's the tube. You can see it's it's broken away from its canister, unfortunately. Um, here's a little container of anti-dimming sticks for gas masks. 
Wipe the inner surface of each eyepiece clean with a soft rag. Breathe on the clean surface and on the anti-dimming stick to moisten them and rub the stick twice across the eyepiece. So this was designed to keep your lenses from fogging so while wearing the mask you could still see uh, what you were doing. And there's the actual mask itself. I've never completely removed it from this bag. It's just so fragile. I uh, just prefer not to. But, um, you know, you could imagine, you know, you hear or you see that gas start drifting across no man's land and the terror that would cause. Um, we'll secure that up later. Because that's how, the, initially, early on, that's what they did. They they had just the bottles of gas, and when the wind was right, they would just open them up and let this gas drift across the fields. And, um, and that's what you would see, and you had to hope you could get your mask on in time, and two, that it was going to work. I mean, you got to remember, this is very early technology, and, uh, you know, the materials and such at the time were, you know, not like more modern gas masks, so... You know, the effectiveness of these, they did help, uh, but I'm, I'm sure they weren't perfect. Um, another weapon of World War One that was truly gruesome and seen for the first time was flamethrowers. And the Germans introduced those. And once again, just kind of a horrific weapon. I mean, you're being burned alive and, um, you know, with gasoline that sticks to you. And uh, this part of this book here talks about that to a certain extent. And, you know, you, there's a lot more information out there you can look up on uh, flamethrowers. But you can see in, the, in this picture kind of how big and clunky they were. They weren't like the World War II ones. But look at that flame. You know, it's a black and white photo, but look at that flame coming out of there. And lastly, for kind of weapons that were unique or new to World War One that really changed things was tanks. You know, the, like I said, the war started with horse cavalry and lances, and, you know, the machine gun quickly proved that to be a futile effort. So they needed a way to get across no man's land and into the German trenches and, and be able to push them out of, of France. And that was that they came up with the idea of tanks. Uh, this is, an, you know, the Brit, common British design. I think it's kind of one of the most iconic designs of tanks uh, in the war and uh, these were designed you can see kind of by the shape to traverse the trenches and uh, and get across um, these had no suspension okay so it was terrible riding in these over you know rough terrain you know there was nothing to absorb up you know the shocks of, of going over the ground not to mention they were hot the engines were in the middle of them so uh, as you bumped around you could burn yourself on the manifolds um, they were, weren't well ventilated there was fumes a lot of guys became casualties in these just from the exhaust so that was a big issue um, but they did prove to be effective even though they had a lot of issues early on mechanically they would break down i mean once in these is early early in the age of gasoline vehicles still um but they did work even though they were very primitive and um so i'm going to end the video with just showing a couple um bolt action rifles that was kind of the staple of infantry soldiers in the war i apologize i'm doing a whole section that talks about them and in here, and I'd like to find it while we talk about them. Oh, I don't know why I had that earlier. Bear with me. Well, we're just going to show them. This book is seen better days. I apologize. Picked that up at a flea market. I thought it was neat, even though it wasn't in great shape. So, what we have here is kind of a staple of the German military. And now, if you're a rifle expert, you're gonna look at this and know this is actually a Czech Mauser, but uh, very sim similar. Uh, the design is almost identical to the German Mauser. And this one was made post World War I, but it worked like most um, rifles at the time. You had a five shot magazine that fed through here. You know, you fed the five rounds in, then you cycled your action. And um, you could fire five shots for this very quickly. Um, that the Austrians used a similar design, although theirs 
the bolt was a little different. That was the um, the Steyr um, 95, I believe. If you look that up, it's a very unique rifle. So, but that's a kind of an example of what a German soldier would have had. Then we have a uh, a British Enfield. Now this is a World War One or excuse me, World War II model. Uh, the only real difference between this and the World War I era is that they're shorter. All the rifles after the war got shorter. Uh, but this fed from a 10 round magazine, but still used the very similar bolt action design. And that was standard in the war was bolt actions. And, um, you know, they would eventually be phased out, you know, after World War II, but that, that design remained in service through World War II. So. Um, I do have a, a, a Russian bolt action I could show you, um, but you got the idea. This was kind of what a soldier moving across uh, no man's land would have had, and he would have been facing artillery fire and machine gun fire while just having this basic bolt action. Um, so we didn't talk about one other item, which was this Soviet revolver. When it came to handguns in the war, revolvers were pretty standard. Um, the U.S. did issue automatics, but even they had still a lot of revolvers in service. And this is a Soviet 7-shot, uh, 1895 Nagant revolver. So this one was actually made in the Soviet era, not the Imperial era, but um, still an example of a well, I hope you enjoyed the video. Sorry for the interruption again. We're just having camera trouble today. But uh, I enjoyed sharing these World War I artifacts and history with you. Uh, comments, questions, uh, feedback, leave it below. And I'll be back with some more videos soon. And I hope everyone has a good Veterans Day. Enjoy time with your family. Enjoy time uh, getting some food out if you have, have that opportunity. And um, everyone have a great weekend. Thank you.